What is the real value of treating fuels by thinning and prescribed burning? How do we design, implement, and maintain fuel treatments to get the best return on investment? Many of these questions were answered in late June and early July of 2014 when the San Juan fire ignited in the White Mountains of Arizona. The San Juan fire provided a direct test of a series of fuels and habitat improvement treatments that have been implemented across the Apache Sitgraves National Forests over the past 10 years. So the San Juan fire started June 26th, about noon. Uh, we'd been in restrictions for quite a while. Fire danger was very high. I stepped out of the supervisor's office in Springerville and, uh, you know, which is, I don't know, 15 miles away or so, 20 miles away, had a very large column visible, knew we had an active fire. Was real wind driven that first afternoon. Sustained crown fire through the mixed conifer, through the ponderosa. Uh, we anchored in at the heel, secured the reservation side. It did start on Fort Apache, but uh, quickly moved on to the Apache Sigreaves. So we concentrated on securing the anchor and uh, getting the flanks started up the flanks with the dozers. It was spot in a quarter to a half mile out in front of itself. It had spotted into several White Mountain stewardship treatments, some of which had been burned previously broadcast and piles, um, but they were kind of spread out in the spectrum of how, uh, when they exactly had been treated, how many years it had been since they'd been treated. But the spots weren't really taken off. So instead of having to go into a point protection, uh, we had a, obviously a limited amount of resources that first evening. They were all local engines. Um, and some hotshot crews, instead of having to go into point protection and send those folks up to the houses and start doing triage and structure prep, uh, we could actually put them on the fire ground and they were taking suppression action, which really helped my division soups. It really helped us get a solid anchor. We were able to progress quite a ways up each flank that first night. Uh, but in all honesty, the original box that I looked at from the air, I was able to shrink down because of the fire behavior and the way it was mitigated once it hit the treatments. You know, for a fire in June, they don't all get huge, but uh, for the winds this fire had on it, um, the time of year, the indices, uh, the lack of moisture we had last winter, 665, 6,900, 7,000 acres, whatever it ended up at, it's really relatively a pretty small footprint on the landscape. One way that we map severity is called ravage maps, which are rapid assessment of vegetation um, post-fire. So looking at a ravage map in this area, everything that is in green are areas that burned with low severity. So we're looking at less than 25% of the overstory having suffered mortality. The areas in yellow are going to be those areas that suffered moderate severity. So between 25 to 50% of the overstory is affected by fire. And then the areas in red are areas of high severity where we see 75% or more of those areas suffering mortality due to fire. When we look at the map, we can see that the origin, so kind of the south central area and up the mountain towards the center of the fire scar is all in high severity. So those areas did not have any kind of treatment in it. There was a high wind behind them um, and they had slope in their favor, so we saw some more intense fire in those areas. Then right after that we start entering these areas where we did see treatments, so either burns or um, thinning treatments or restoration treatments. And in these areas we see much more of that um, yellow and green color indicating less high severity fire, so more green. Then the rest, the flanks, so the areas on the west side and the east side of the fire, we see a lot more low severity. And that's where we can see evidence of the opportunities to take suppression action that were a benefit to the resource. So they burned with low severity in those areas. And so what I saw, I was out here about five days after this area burned. And as I walked up the stream, you could see where the ground fire had come up to the riparian area. There was the odd alder or two that burned, but in general, as you can see, all of the alders in the riparian area is in beautiful shape. You know, and I attribute that to the mechanical thinning, but also importantly to Rob's prescribed burning that had just happened, you know, the May 2013 before in protecting this area from the fire as it came through, especially given how drought stressed this entire area was when the San Juan fire occurred. 
It was the lowest that we'd seen Mineral Creek at. On average, it was about an inch deep. And the alders, and you could tell that they were drought stressed. And yet, because of the prescribed burning in the thinning, this riparian area is preserved. They were ultimately, by treating, they were able to reduce the intensity of the fire, um, which is important, like I said, for the canopy cover as well as the ground cover. Keeping those intact helps protect the soil and ultimately slows down water and erosional processes. Where that fire intersected previous treatments, previous thinnings, the effects of the fire on the ground will be one of returning energy to the soils for recruitment into grasses, forbs, and browse, and future tree recruitment where, where that occurs. So overall, a, a great deal of that fire will be a net energy gain back into the system. From, from a wildlife perspective, that's important in those, the, those energies being available in species that wildlife consume. The reduced fire behavior in the treated areas allowed firefighters on the San Juan to employ more patience in implementing their suppression strategy. Firefighters were able to conduct fire suppression activities in a thoughtful and patient manner that favored low intensity burning, which ultimately led to more favorable outcomes both for forest health and firefighter safety. These treatments allow for firefighters to have a little bit more time, a little bit more flexibility in how they're implementing their suppression actions. So when we take actions such as putting in a back burn, we're, we're able to take that action in a way that's not going to destroy resources. So we can burn a little slower, we can take a little bit more time and provide for some benefit from those suppression actions to the ecosystem. As far as strategy for the fuel type or for the the fuel treatments, um, they varied, but we definitely looked at those and utilized them to our benefit. They helped a ton to varied degrees depending on what had been done on that you know that piece of ground. But uh, yeah, the divisions, the crews, I know felt a lot safer going into that stuff. You know, you're burning in open pine and grass versus trying to do daytime burning or even nighttime burning in mixed conifer. Um, you know, it says a lot when a lot of our burnouts, we had to kind of ixnay that plan and go direct because the fire just wouldn't move around through it. If you look at the different treatments and the different intensities um, going through there, you can see that the thinning, pile burn, and then the broadcast burn on top of that, frankly, was probably the most effective. And it took a kind of a full frontal hit by a head fire. Um, and you can see when we, you know, when we look at a severity mapping and some of that, that uh, it kind of bears out that way. The White Mountain Stewardship Project was a 10-year contract awarded in 2004 to thin overstocked forests in the White Mountains of Arizona. Over 72,000 acres have been thinned on the Apache Sitgraves National Forest. A portion of the thinned areas received follow-up treatments with prescribed fire supported in large part by the Arizona Game and Fish Department, the Arizona Habitat Partnership Committee, and the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. We treated a, a percentage, say in this case it might be 50-60% uh, of the area mechanically, but it tells another story. If you can see the hatch mark, and I'll follow my finger around it right here, this is an area that has been burned after the mechanical treatment because there, there's burning that needs to be done. And I'm not talking about burning a slash. In these areas, the slash was removed, but you still have that, that, the, the surface biomass and you have the, the, the return of the nutrients to the soil that the mechanical treatments just can't do. And this is very typical of the percentage over this whole large area that we've actually treated with fire. So even though we've done these 72,000 acres of mechanical treatment, we've done only a small portion of that and, and, and actually finish the treatment with the fire that's needed. These, these treatments uh, don't maintain themselves. If we don't do prescribed burning where we've thinned, you can tell with the amount of reprod coming up here that that's gonna be a mechanical problem within a couple decades or so. Um, but that problem's really gonna start when the tree gets to exceed your size or exceeds the size that you can kill it with fire. So when you get to, that tree gets to about this big and we can't kill it with needle casting grass, 
that's already become a mechanical problem that you just haven't realized yet. And it'll really be a mechanical problem 20 years from then. So, um, and all these treatments, they're not maintaining themselves. Sometimes a wildfire is doing some of it for us. And sometimes we're broadcast burning, but we have got to keep up with that maintenance wise. So we don't lose a, a significant investment in those thinned areas. The San Juan fire demonstrated the value and importance of fuel treatments in mitigating fire behavior and providing fire management opportunities. This resulted in more favorable fire effects for a wide range of natural resource values on the forest, and most importantly, provided for increased safety of the firefighters on the line and the surrounding communities.